In 1985, Back to the Future hits theaters becoming an instant classic. Taking center stage was the odd and eccentric DeLorean DMC-12. Created by a prodigious playboy businessman who made a series of risky business moves, the DeLorean was nearly erased from history altogether. How did a man slated to be the president of GM both create and destroy his own motor company in just two years, yet somehow still produce one of the most iconic cars in history? For the full story, we have to take a trip back in time. In 1975, John Z. DeLorean was known as a promising engineer and a suave business innovator. From the early 50s, he designed and built cars, transmissions, and drivetrains for companies like Chrysler and Packard Motor Company. In the mid-60s, he was instrumental in developing Pontiac's landmark GTO. By the 70s, DeLorean had climbed the ladder at GM, becoming the youngest executive in the company's history. In fact, DeLorean was in line to become GM's next president, essentially American royalty. But by that time, DeLorean had grown tired of GM in light of his budding celebrity status. He openly criticized GM, questioning their business practices and their overall grip on what the public desired for automobiles. So in 1973, DeLorean left GM it was very rewarding financially, and it would have been easy to sit there for another 17 years collecting three quarters of a million dollars a year, but that really didn't appeal to me very much. Two years later, founded his own would-be empire, the DeLorean Motor Company. The company's only production model was the DMC-12. Created by Italian designer Giorgetto Giuliano and engineered by Lotus founder Colin Chapman, the DMC-12 was meant to be the vehicle of the future. It featured unconventional design elements like its now infamous gullwing doors supported by cryogenically preset torsion bars and nitrogen charge struts. Because of the shorter door panels, the DMC-12 also included small cutout toll booth windows. It also featured unpainted steel panels and a rear mounted engine. From its inception, the car was truly out of this world. DMC immediately generated buzz. Early investments flew in from the likes of Tonight Show host Johnny Carson and entertainers Roy Clark and Sammy Davis Jr. DeLorean also devised a clever investment plan in which car dealerships would be required to hold a minimum of $25,000 in DMC stock in order to sell the car on their lots. But creating and manufacturing a new car from scratch would require a whole lot more capital, prompting DeLorean to seek out lucrative incentives from various government organizations. To win these investments, DeLorean intentionally sought out regions where unemployment was particularly high. I happen to believe that the cure to a lot of the problems of the world is economic, is providing jobs. Initial deals with Pennsylvania, Saudi Arabia, and the Republic of Ireland faded. A $60 million plan with Puerto Rico nearly went through but was undercut at the last second by Northern Ireland who offered to pony up a whopping $120 million, making up more than half of the company's total startup cost. The British government was very willing to create jobs in Northern Ireland to help bring stability to the region, a component that will come into play later in the story. With both their funding and land settled upon, a 72-acre lot just outside Belfast, DMC was ready to get cracking. Unfortunately, the rocky, mountainous, cow-covered hillsides where the factory was to be built required extensive landscaping, all of which had to be accomplished in less than 18 months so that production could start. Before the factories had even broken ground, DeLorean was already racing against the clock. But this was only the beginning of DeLorean's problems. The company began production in a time known as the Troubles, in which Northern Ireland fought brutally to decide whether they would remain a part of the Republic of Ireland or join the UK. Sectarian violence plagued the city streets. It was this precise instability that prompted the UK to lure DeLorean overseas, hoping this company would bring financial security to the region. While the DeLorean factory wasn't impacted so much by the violence, the production schedule did suffer as a result of various hunger strikes and protests. In addition, many of the factory employees lacked experience. Many never had jobs before joining DMC and this eventually contributed to quality issues in early production vehicles. Unit production was scheduled to begin in 1979, but engineering delays and budget overruns caused the assembly lines to start only in early 1981. Yet despite the rocky start, the DMC-12 rolled off the production line and into dealerships on January 21st, 1981, though to some mixed reviews. Initial response was generally positive. 
with Motor Trend, Road and & Track, and Car and & Driver praising the car's commendable fuel economy and innovative design. But as time went on, the reviews began to sour. One sticking point was the $25,000 MSRP, approximately $70,000 today, an inflated markup for what many saw as an underperforming garage decoration. Performance itself was another issue. Despite its theatrical reputation, the car topped out at 85 miles per hour, not even enough to get Marty McFly back home. With an acceleration rate of 0-60 to in just over 8 seconds for the manual transmission and a sluggish 10.5 seconds for the automatic, the DMC-12 was by no means a barn burner. Of course, these figures only applied to the cars that actually worked. Within the first year of production, DeLorean issued four separate recalls, addressing everything from sticking throttles to front suspension and a slew of other headaches. DeLorean eventually mended these issues, but by the time they did, it was too little too late. The company estimated its break-even point at around 10,000 units, but within a year of production, they only reached about 6,000. Without the constant influx of cash, the company found itself running headlong into a truck full of manure. To make matters worse, the British government decided to turn off the faucet. Conservative Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher lacked motivation to shell out more money to an American company. Buzzing rumors of diverted interests, fishy corporate structure, and fraud didn't help. By February 1982, the company went into receivership, basically forced bankruptcy. But the biggest scandal of all was waiting just around the corner. On October 19, 1982, DeLorean was arrested for trying to fund his business in an unusual, if not incredibly ballsy way. And no, he didn't travel back in time to win bets using his sports almanac. The details of this chapter in the story tend to vary. But the gist of it is that at some point in 1982, John DeLorean became the target of an FBI sting operation designed to arrest drug traffickers. He was arrested and charged with conspiracy to smuggle $24 million worth of cocaine into the US, money which was rumored to be used to vitalize the dying company. DeLorean was ultimately acquitted with the argument of entrapment. The key evidence was a videotape showing DeLorean discussing a drug deal with undercover FBI agents. Though he was never officially convicted of smuggling or fraud, the damage was done. With the arrest and the fraud claims following two years of risky business maneuvers, it looked like the DeLorean Motor Company was history. By May of 1982, production of the DMC factory had ceased, with 9,000 units made between January 1981 and December 1982. With this company in the grave and his once sparkling reputation in ruins, John DeLorean faded away into obscurity, with his prized experiment on the brink of fading with him. But just when it seemed like the DeLorean would be lost to the annals of history, like so many vehicles before it, something magical happened that would alter the course of the car's future forever. In 1985, Back to the Future was released to global success. And at the center of this time travel based sci-fi family adventure was none other than the DeLorean DMC-12. The movie, released three years after DeLorean Motor Company's demise, blasted the DeLorean into global pop culture icon status and generated a love for the car that prevails to this day. Even in 2020, DeLorean enthusiasts the world over connect online and in person to show off their prized vehicles and revel in all of the obscure glory. In the wake of DMC's demise, a handful of businesses emerged to provide genuine DeLorean parts and service to the few thousand DeLoreans still out on the road. Though flux capacitors are still considered aftermarket parts, these companies and fans keeping the DeLorean legend alive today are not simply holding on to a relic of a checkered past. They are proof that a great idea can endure even despite the shortcomings of its creator. Though the clock has long run out on the DeLorean Motor Company, this iconic vehicle has ascended to become a timeless classic. <laughs>